Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to my talk and thanks in advance for your feedback. I will argue that we should reject the resultant moral lock, that the resultant moral lock does not exist. Resultant moral lock occurs when someone can correctly be morally judged despite the fact that how things turn out is beyond their control. Here's one way to illustrate it. Take two drivers, lucky and unlucky. Lucky is a drunk driver. She gets into her car, drives home safe and sound. Unlucky is a drunk driver. She gets into her car, but on the way home, a kid jumps into the road and she runs the kid over, killing the kid. Note that the difference between these two cases is due to a factor beyond both drivers' control, whether um, a kid jumps into the road or not. Despite this fact, many have the intuition that Lucky is less blameworthy, less morally responsible, if at all, compared to Unlucky. If this is the case, if this is right, then we're committed to resultant moral luck. And I will argue that we should reject this sort of moral luck. This is how the argument will go. In premise one, I will argue that if proportionality luck entails implausible results, then we should reject it. I will explain what proportionality luck is, but I will not further dwell on premise one. I will just assume that if a view um, entails highly implausible results, we should reject it. Premise two says proportionality lock entails implausible results, and I will defend this premise. First conclusion, we should reject proportionality lock. Premise three, if we should reject proportionality lock, we should also reject resultant moral lock, and I will defend this premise. And the final conclusion, we should reject resultant moral lock. Now, proportionality lock. It's a kind of moral lock that is argued for in a recent Sarah Bernstein paper, and here's what it is. Proportionality lock occurs when someone is more or less morally responsible for an outcome because she causally contributed more or less to the outcome due to factors beyond her control. So take these two cases to illustrate this definition here. Victim and hardy victim. In victim, we have two independently employed assassins unaware of each other. They are dispatched to eliminate victim. Being struck by one bullet is sufficient to kill victim. Each assassin shoots and victim dies. Note that this is a case of Overdetermination in that we have multiple sufficient causes. The other case, Hardy victim. Again, we have two independently employed assassins, each unaware of each other. They're dispatched to eliminate victim. Unbeknownst to both assassins, however, in this case, victim is particularly hardy and requires two bullets for his demise. Each assassin shoots and victim dies. Note that this is a case of joint causation in that we have two um, uh, necessary causes. And note also that. What makes this causal difference between these two cases is victim's hardiness, and it's a factor beyond the assassin's control. So the question now is, which pair of assassins is more or less morally responsible? Bernstein argues that to, to, to answer this question, we need to find out how much each pair of assassins causally contributes to the outcome. The more you causally contribute to an outcome, the more morally responsible you are. So uh, if one thinks that uh, causation is a matter of producing an outcome, bringing about a certain outcome, then one might think that causal contribution is something along the lines, that it takes two assassins to produce the outcome in hardy victim, right? So that would mean that each assassin partially causally contributes to the outcome. Hence, each, is, each assassin in hardy victim is partially morally responsible for the outcome, as opposed to each assassin in victim being uh, fully morally responsible for the outcome. Uh, one might also think of causation in terms of uh, counterfactual conception of causation. That is, uh, one, would, one, one might think that um, causation is a matter of counterfactual dependence between wholly distinct events. In that case, one might uh, have a different assessment of these two cases. In the victim, each assassin is necessary for the outcome. That is, if one failed to shoot, the death wouldn't occur. As each assassin in hardy victim is more essential to the death. This implies that each assassin in hardy victim causally contributes more and has, uh, are more morally responsible for the outcome, not less. So depending on what account of causal contribution one employs, one gets different results as to which pair of assassins causally contribute more to the outcome. But regardless of that, uh, we have the, uh, the moral differentiation between the pair of assassins, and that depends on a factor beyond their control, which victims' hardiness. So for that matter, proportionality lock itself does not depend on any specific kind of causal contribution, and in much the same way, my counterargument won't depend on any specific kind of causal contribution either, but I will employ these two accounts that Bernstein employs as well. So my defense of premise two, which says proportionality lock entails implausible results, 
take again the productive conception of causal contribution above. The suggestion above implies that if there were three assassins in Hardy victim and it took three bullets to kill victim, each assassin would be even less morally responsible. In that case, I argue now, take this, case two. Uh, the victim is protected by an electromagnetic field. It will take a great many bullets to kill her. A great many assassins unaware of each other are set up to kill her. For all they know, they can kill her with one bullet. They all shoot and she dies. Proportionality lock in this case entails that each of these assassins is only negligibly morally responsible, that each of them is only negligibly blameworthy. They're barely blameworthy, which seems implausible to me. We're talking about people who went out there, killed someone, and just went home. They did this uh, intentionally, knowingly, and etc. And um, it seems highly implausible to think that uh, these assassins are barely blameworthy for what they've done. Proportionality lock also entails that assassins in Hardy victim are tremendously more morally responsible than assassins in case two. And again, it seems that, again, we're talking about people who went out there, just killed someone and went home. And for all they know, they were the only one who went out there to kill this person. And the mere fact that there were two people or three people or four people or great many other people who wanted to do the same heinous crime uh, doesn't seem to decrease one's uh, view of blameworthiness and not to that tremendous degree. Um, so these are the implausible results that and uh, proportionality like entails and similar results could be generated by using the counterfactual kind, of kind of causal contribution, but to use my time wisely, I will not elaborate on that. You're welcome to take a look at this part of the handout if you're interested. So my defense premise three now, if we should reject proportionality like we should reject also resultant moral luck and premise three rests on the following, that resultant moral luck cannot plausibly avoid the implausible results that proportionality luck entails. And this is because, as I will argue, if you're committed to resultant moral luck, you cannot plausibly avoid being committed to proportionality luck. And to do that, I will expose some of the claims that these two views are committed to. One, uh, resultant moral luck is committed to what one causes may depend on factors beyond one's control. And this was illustrated by drunk driver cases above that um, uh, what one actually caused, what, what the unlucky driver actually caused depended on a factor beyond her control. And the fact that the other driver didn't cause also um, uh, depended on a factor beyond, beyond her control. So uh, second claim, what one causes, even when it depends on factors beyond one's control, affects one's moral responsibility. And again, this was illustrated by that very same case. Proportionality like is, is also committed to two similar claims. How much one causes an outcome may depend on factors beyond one's control. In case of victim and hardy victim, it was victim's hardiness that determined the, the, the difference, the causal difference between the two cases and it's a factor beyond the assassin's control. And how much one causes a co how much one causes it contributes to an outcome affects one's moral responsibility. This is the fourth claim and the second claim that proportionality uh, lock is committed to was also illustrated by those two cases above, uh, victim and hardy victim. So now the question is whether one could hold one and two, but plausibly reject three and four. And I will argue that one cannot do that. So how could one try to do it? Uh, so the question, the first question now could be whether one could deny number four while one is committed to uh, number two. Well, to do that, one would be claiming that what one causes is a morally relevant factor, whereas how much one causes is not a morally relevant factor. This just seems arbitrary to me, hence this option seems implausible. Uh, next, can one deny uh, number uh, three while one is committed to number one? I think this is implausible too, uh, in that these two theses, they are independently correct and they, uh, they portray something that is just the very nature of causation or causal contribution in that anytime we attempt to cause something or cause to contribute something, um, there are many other potential causal factors that might get into process and, and uh, we might end up um, actually bringing about something that we didn't intend to. Uh, next, um, one could deny number three and number four just by denying that causal contribution comes in degrees and not in and of itself in resultant moral luck commits one to the idea that causal contribution comes in degrees. So now the question becomes 
whether uh, it is plausible to deny that causal contribution comes in degrees. Now I will consider some objections to that thesis and argue that they fail. First objection. On most contemporary accounts, causation does not come in degrees. That is, on most contemporary accounts, causation is on-off. So I might worry whether the same applies to causal contribution. Carolina Sartoria, in a couple of her papers, raises a con concern along these lines. But concern seems misguided to me in that what is in question is causal contribution, not causation. Take again uh, a productive conception of causation according to which causation is a matter of bringing about or producing an outcome. So one might think that whether you produce something or not is on off. Either you produce it or not, that's it. However, one might still think that what one produces might constitute a bigger or small portion of an outcome. And in that way, one could think that uh, what one produces, um, whether that constitutes a, a smaller or bigger portion of, of an outcome, uh, could be a matter of degree, uh, where, uh, whereas uh, what one produces is not a matter of degree. Hence, objection one fails. Objection two, uh, take this case now. Ten teenagers push a boulder down the hill. None of them is strong enough for the task. Hence, each of them is causally necessary and not as sufficient for the outcome. And if this is the case, then maybe it's misleading to think of them contributing to the outcome to greater or lesser extent. Michael Zimmerman um, raised a concern along these lines uh, in papers. However, it seems unclear to me why the thought should be misleading. Take this. Um, suppose we have two people, Susie and Timmy. Susie has seven gallons of water. Timmy has 10 gallons of water. And we need 10 gallons of water. Uh, sorry, Timmy has three gallons of water. And we have we need 10 gallons of water, and no one else has any other water. Now, Timmy uh, pours his three gallons of water into a bucket, and Susie pours her seven gallons of water into the same bucket when we have the outcome that we wanted. And in this case, both Susie and Timmy, each of them in much the same way is causally necessary, and none of them is causally sufficient for the outcome, which is 10 gallons of water. But it still seems that Susie, with her seven gallons of water, causally contributes more to the outcome than Timmy with his uh, three gallons of water. So objection two fails as well. Objection three, two different accounts of causal contributions, uh, causal contribution give us conflicting results in victim and hardy victim. Remember I said that depending on uh, which account of causal contribution one employs, one gets different results as to which pair of assassins causally contributes more to the outcome. Uh, well, one might worry what results this impasse, that is, which pair of assassins actually causally contributes more to the outcome. And at that point, one might think that maybe one runs out of intuition, maybe one doesn't even have any idea where to go from there. And from that on, one might think that maybe the idea that causal contribution comes in degrees is an illusion. Again, Carolina Sartoria in one of her recent papers argues for something like this, but this conclusion seems premature to me in that we don't typically think that if two accounts of X gives us sometimes sometimes gives us conflicting results about X, uh, X is an illusion. We don't think that way. What's an example of that? Well, take the utilitarian principle of moral, moral, uh, morally right action and wrong action and the Kantian uh, categorical imperative. These two principles sometimes give us conflicting results as to whether an action is moral right or wrong, but we don't, from there on, uh, think that, okay, moral rightness and wrongness should be an illusion. And above and beyond these objections failing, I think we have a lot of motivation to accept that causal contribution companies in that in everyday life, we use expression like something being more of a cause of an outcome, something contributing more to the outcome, um, something um, being, uh, being, again, more of a cause of an outcome. We use these expressions a lot, and these are useful tools, and not just in everyday life, but, it, but in also uh, natural and social sciences, um, these are useful tools in that, for instance, a historian might describe, um, um, might, might think that um, nationalism was a bigger contributor of World War I than, say, economic factors. Hence, uh, I think we have a lot of good motivation to accept that causal contribution comes in degrees, while all these three objections against that, against that thesis fails, and that would mean that causal contribution comes in degrees is a plausible one, plausible thesis, and it seems implausible to deny that thesis. And this finalizes my defense for premise three, 
and I have already defended the other crucial premise in my argument, which was premise two, and hence I take it that my conclusion here that we should reject more uh, resultant moral luck is established. Thank you for listening.